Good afternoon and welcome to today's WISE webinar. My name is Jamie Pendergrafts and I'm the Communications and Outreach Director for the Ticket to Work program. Thank you for joining us today. It's my pleasure to introduce today's moderator, Patricia Van Nelson. Pat is the Deputy Director of the Ticket Program Manager and has over 30 years of related experience to bring to today's topic and discussion. Pat, over to you. Well, thank you, Jamie. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Reasonable Accommodations and the Employment Process. As Jamie said, my name is Pat Van Nelson, and I'm a member of the Ticket to Work team, and I'll be your moderator. On behalf of Social Security and the entire Ticket team, thank you for joining us to learn about the Ticket program and Reasonable Accommodations, what they are, who they help, and how to request them. I expect that many of you are already familiar with some of the material we're going to cover. Somewhere along the line, I'm hoping someone told you about your rights, or you researched them yourself. Perhaps you've even educated your family or friends about these subjects. As for me, I've learned a great deal since working with the Ticket Program and the folks at Social Security. But before that, I was pretty clueless. Some of you are going to think this is really lame, but years ago I was working on an Army base in a trailer one of my very favorite jobs, by the way, and I had the opportunity to work with a woman who was deaf. I was amazed to find that she had a service dog who worked alongside her. At that time, I thought only people who were blind had service dogs, and I had no idea that there was a law that gave her the right to that accommodation. I know it seems old school now because the public is so much better educated. However, there are still some employers who haven't quite mastered the full scope of what reasonable accommodations are and what their responsibilities are to provide them. Today, our goal is to make sure you are well informed and prepared when you enter or return to the workforce. If you've joined us for a webinar before, you've probably heard me say that I think one of the best things about the Ticket Program is that it recognizes that we're each unique and every one of us creates our own path. In the context of today's webinar, what that means is that reasonable accommodations are also unique to you, your disability, your work environment. In today's webinar, we'll give you some examples to help you find accommodations that will work for you. So let's get started. Before we jump into learning about the ticket program and reasonable accommodations, I want to make sure you get the most out of the information we're going to share. So we have a few tips for using this webinar platform. First, there's the audio. You can manage your audio using the audio option at the top of your screen. The audio option is an icon that looks like a speaker. When you click on it, there's a drop-down menu. Choose Select Speaker from the menu options, as you can see on the screen. Just a reminder, everyone who's attending will be muted except for me and, of course, eventually our speaker. When it asks how you want to join the meeting's audio, pick Device Speaker if you want the sound to come through your computer. And, of course, be sure to turn on your speakers or plug in your headphones. If you'd rather listen by phone, you can dial 1-800-832-0736 and enter area access code 418 148 and then the pound sign. You can also use the join the meeting audio to receive a phone call as you'll see in the image on the screen and then just enter the same number and access code. All right now let's move to cover some information about the webinar's accessibility. On the Adobe Connect platform you'll notice different boxes on your screen. Those boxes are called pods. We have the presentation pod, and this is where the slide deck is appearing. That's the largest portion of your screen. Below that's an open space for placement of closed captioning. The top right corner is the Q&A pod, and below that is the web links pod. We'll talk about those pods in a little more detail in a bit, but first let's talk about accessibility. If you need assistance navigating Adobe Connect, an accessibility user guide 
It has a list of controls is available on the website at http colon forward slash forward slash bit dot ly forward slash adobe hyphen accessibility. A link to this guide is also available in the web links pod in the bottom right of your screen. It's called Adobe Accessibility User Guide. So if you want that one, you can go into the WebLinks pod and access it now. Real-time captioning is available and active and is displayed in the captioning pod. You can show or hide the captioning display, and you can also choose the size and color of the text to best meet your own vision preference. To open closed captioning, select the CC option from the top menu bar. The captioning link can also be accessed on the web links pod under the title Web Captioning. You can also access captioning online in a separate viewing window. Choice is up to you and how you want to see it. If you're fluent in American Sign Language and you'd like support during today's webinar, please follow the link. It provides instructions on how to connect with an interpreter through the Federal Communication Commission's video relay service. The ASL User Guide is available in the web links pod under the title ASL User Guide. We're going to be pausing to answer your questions at two different points in the webinar. You can send your questions to us at any time during the webinar by typing them into the Q&A pod. I'll then direct the questions to our presenter during the Q&A portions of the webinar. I'm going to do my best to get to as many as possible. If you're listening by phone and you're not logged into the webinar platform, you can ask your questions by sending an email to us at webinars at choosework.ssa.gov. I've already referred you to the web links pod a couple of times. That's where you'll find the links for all the resources we'll cover today. Just select the ones that interest you to learn more. If you're listening by phone, you can email webinars at choosework.ssa.gov for a list of those resources. You can also look at your confirmation email that you received for today's webinar to see these resources. Just a reminder, Social Security cannot guarantee and isn't responsible for the accessibility of external websites. We're recording today's webinar. So if you missed something and you want to go back and listen again, we'll be posting it within two weeks on the Choose Work website at https colon forward slash forward slash bit dot ly forward slash wise underscore on demand. This link is also in the web links pod called Wise Webinar Archives. We hope you have a good experience during this webinar and that your technology will cooperate. However, if you do run into a technical difficulties, please use the Q&A pod to send us a message. Or you can email us at that site I mentioned before, webinars at choosework.ssa.gov, and our team will help you. In a minute, you're going to hear from my colleague and today's presenter, Derek Shields. Derek's no stranger to the intersection of disability and work. He spent the past 28 years in the areas of disability inclusion, employment, accessibility, and reasonable accommodations. Specifically, he spent nearly 20 years working with multiple federal agencies' reasonable accommodation and assistive technology programs. Derek has a master's degree in management and disability services from the University of San Francisco. And in addition to his contributions to the ticket program, he's also president of Forward Works Consulting and a co-founder and board advisor of the National Disability Mentoring Coalition. I'll be back with you during the Q&A session, so remember to put your questions in that Q&A pod. It's now my pleasure to turn the microphone over to Derek. Pat, thank you so much for the kind introduction and for uh, your opening remarks and really setting the stage for everyone's success today with our webinar. It's exciting to be with you. Uh, for our monthly webinar and today on the 33rd anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act to talk about the ADA and about reasonable accommodations. <clears throat> so it's great to be here for this topic of reasonable accommodations in the employment process. 
Um, on the screen, we do have our five um, chapters for the content of the webinar today, we'll call them. Um, of course, we're gonna always cover um, Social Security's Tick to Work program. Um, and as I mentioned, being the 33rd anniversary of the ADA, we'll talk about the Americans with Disabilities Act um, and that civil rights legislation. Um, we'll get into disability disclosure, um, kind of what it is, and give some tips about um, choices that you might have. Uh, and then, of course, we're going to talk about reasonable accommodations, you know, how to request them, and different types of reasonable accommodations, and then some resources that we'll have along the way that um, perhaps could expand your toolkit um, to give you a little bit more confidence when considering reasonable accommodations throughout the employment process. So we do have a lot to, to cover. We have the two breaks, so Pat can get your questions um, to me and we could um, have a dialogue on those and um, we look forward to that. But without further ado, I'm gonna jump in to make sure that we can cover our content today. This month, we're pleased to feature one of our success stories, Matt. And I'm gonna be referencing Matt's um, employment process and uh, pathway to employment um, and how he obtained self-sufficiency through work. Um, this is gonna come throughout the webinar. It's a little bit woven in to the content uh, that we have. And we're gonna specifically talk about Matt's experience involving reasonable accommodations. So really without further ado, let's meet Matt. So here's a picture of Matt on the screen. He's a, a white male um, with a bald head and he's wearing a plaid shirt with folded arms. Um, Matt received Social Security Disability Insurance or SSDI uh, because he has hearing loss. Matt's actually deaf and other different medical issues that were interfering with his ability to hold consistent employment. And he was determined to have choices that really steady work affords individuals. And he knew from his previous intermittent experiences with work um, that he had value to bring. He had analytical skills, organizational skills, and he spent a lot of time working with spreadsheets. So he considered himself skillful there as well. Um, and on, as it's quoted on the screen, you know, as we learn about Matt's story, he's quoted here as saying, I always wanted and planned to work and he wanted to be productive, build a career and earn more money. Um, so with this in mind, you know, Matt early on knew that he wanted to access guidance to help him do just that and find that support as he considered his future. On this slide, we do have a link to Matt's success story. And if you're interested in that, you could access that through the web links pod, as Pat described, that's in the bottom right corner, and it's gonna be tagged as your item number eight. And we'll be speaking about Matt's return to work experience throughout the webinar, and of course, his reasonable accommodations experience, both as an applicant and as a worker in the workforce. So Matt's journey starts out back in high school, and you know this is when he learned about state vocational rehabilitation agencies. And these VR agencies, as we call them, have programs that help people with disabilities who are interested in work, go to work. And Matt decided to, you know, remembering what he heard in high school, you know, when he was determined to access work while on SSDI, he decided to contact his local VR agency for some support and assistance, really seeking that guidance. And the VR counselor then explained that Social Security's Ticket to Work program could provide those, the guidance and support, or really, as we call them, the comprehensive employment services that he needed. And so at this point, what I'd like to do is talk about Ticket to Work for a moment, and then we'll get back to Matt's story. So what is Social Security's Ticket to Work program? You know, some of you might know, but I'm sure we have folks that are here that are interested in learning about that. And so we always like to cover it. Um, the Ticket to Work program, first of all, is free and voluntary. This is important. There is no cost to participate. Uh, you know, to qualify, you need, do need to be between ages 18 through 64 and individuals who are receiving Social Security disability benefits. That's either 
SSDI, the disability insurance I mentioned earlier, or SSI, that's supplemental security income, or you could receive both. And you have to want to work, and that gives you access to these free career development services that we were mentioning. Uh, you know, if it sounds like that's something for you, there are those services, and they come through the employment team. Some of those members of, you know, the different service providers that are could be on your employment team through the ticket program include employment networks. We call them ENs for short. And these employment networks provide services like career counseling and assistance with job placement, uh, including helping people understand how benefits may impact work. Um, and, and that's, of course, critical. So the ticket program can connect you to those free employment services and help you decide if work is right for you. If you do tap those services like Matt did, you can help get that help in preparing for work. And that includes specific um, you know, assistance in finding a job and services and supports that can help you succeed at, at work once you start the job. It's really a great program. And what we wanna do now is see how Matt tapped the ticket program with his experience. So back to Matt, it turns out that Matt's VR counselor, you know, connected him with a specific Pennsylvania-based employment network. This ENs called Community Integrated Services. And that group would remain by his side through each step from application to employment and actually beyond employment, quite beyond literally. But we'll get to that in a little bit. Matt's story takes a turn where CIS uh, comes back into his employments. Um, first, though, Matt worked with a job development team at CIS, and those folks uh, included a career counselor, a sign language interpreter. Recall, Matt's deaf, so he needed that interpreter to assist in communication with others. Matt also worked with a benefits counselor, and a benefits counselor you know, as a professional that's qualified to advise individuals, in this case, Matt, about the Im impact that work would have on the disability benefits he was receiving, SSDI. We have two links here if you're interested in learning more about CIS or about benefits counselors. You can find those. CIS is link number 10 in the web links pod, and the benefits counselor link is under item number 11. So check those out. You can select those um, during the webinar if you're interested. So after helping Matt with his resume and you know, kind of crafting out, well, what kind of skills do you have and potential job leads that would match up for those skills, uh, CIS helped Matt practice um, those interviews uh, for those interviews. You know, Matt and all of us get a little bit nervous when we're we have a goal and we're trying to tell our story and be able to act um, uh, in an interview fashion. So this Ian really assisted him there and the career council uh, counselor actually advised him about reasonable accommodations along with his legal rights under the Americans with Disabilities Act. Specifically for Matt, because of the ADA, he had uh, a legal right to reasonable accommodations as an applicant, but also to perform his job duties. And this helped him become more confident, you know, about how he was going to be able to make his ask for those reasonable accommodations. So thinking of the ADA and reasonable accommodations, let's use Matt's story now to explore these two important topics, the ADA and reasonable accommodations. So again, it's the 33rd anniversary of the ADA going back to July 26, 1990. This is when the civil rights law that prohibits discrimination based on dif disability was passed. And it, it prohibits this discrimination in a lot of different areas. And the significant point of the ADA is really to enable people to live and work in their communities, specifically people with disabilities to live and work in their communities like non-disabled individuals do. There are different sections of the ADA, and I'll cover them now if you're not familiar with them, um, you know, briefly. 
Title I protects people in regards to employment. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Title II of the ADA focuses on state and local governments. And this is like public entities, and this includes things like public transportation. It also includes, if you noticed and tracked this just yesterday, the Department of Justice provided some draft new regulations under Title II. If they would pass, it would increase accessibility requirements to ensure um, state and local government websites, places where you might apply for, oh, let's say a driver's license or a fishing regulated license or something like that, those websites would have to meet uh, higher accessibility standards. So Title II is actually in evolving now, 33 years later. And Title III is under a public accommodation, Title III of the ADA. That's things like access to hotels and restaurants buildings needing ramps or restaurants providing alternative menus, perhaps for somebody who's low vision or blind. Title V is telecommunications. That's how we get captioning on the telephone um, or other communications. And Title V, I'm sorry, Title IV is tele telecommunications and Title V deals with things like how to file a lawsuit. So those are the five titles of the ADA all very important for everyone to know about and to use. And in this case for Matt, you know, as I said, Title I focuses on employment and that's really what we're focused on today. And Title I helps individuals access the same employment opportunities and benefits as individuals without disabilities. So it's important to know that the ADA is not an affirmative action law. It's just protecting specific rights and it's not a special benefit. Um, and what it says is you can't treat people with disabilities differently or worse because of the disability. Um, and in this case, if you all should know, you have the same right to apply for jobs, to interview for jobs, and to get hired. And one way of doing that is through, you know, the prohibition of discrimination and access to the tools you need through reasonable accommodation. So, you know, in this case, Matt's counselor informed him he doesn't, um, he needs to be qualified for jobs and you have to be able to perform the essential functions of the job. Um, and it entitles qualified applicants and employees to seek re those reasonable accommodations when needed to have a successful interview experience or to actually perform the essential job functions. So got to be qualified to do the essential functions with or without reasonable accommodations. In some minor instances, if an undue hardship would be imposed on the employer, then the employer wouldn't have to provide that reasonable accommodation. That's very rare because when you think of a lot of these employers, it's not about one team or department's budget for undue hardship. It's the entire company or organization and employer. And in most cases, undue hardship is not, um, uh, is not a, a path to take when on average, 50% of accommodations don't cost anything and the 50% that do, now recent research shows only cost an average of $300. Pretty hard to prove undue hardship these days. So that's good news for applicants. It's good news for workers with disabilities who are seeking reasonable accommodations. Okay, moving forward with Matt's story, his counselor, um, also let them know that in general, you know, the job applicant or employee with the disability is responsible for letting the employer know what they need an accommodation for. And that includes these three areas, participate in the application process, perform the essential job functions. And the third is to receive equal benefits and privileges of, in, of employment. And this is important. You know, we have mentioned application and the role of the applicant, and that's pretty straightforward. If, if you need large print for forms when you're submitting an application, you have to make the request if you happen to have low vision. As an employee, if you need screen magnification software to read the information on your monitor, you have to make that request. The third area, if you want access to like an employee assistance program, or if you want to attend a company's summer picnic, 
and you're deaf and you need a sign language interpreter to communicate with others, you need to make the request. So in all these areas, you have the right to make the request, but it is uh, incumbent upon you to do so. Okay, let's now cover the definition of disability. And then after we do this, we're actually gonna pause for our first break for questions. So it's an important like understanding that we should have who is qualified as an individual with a disability under the Americans with Disabilities Act. And it's what we call a three-pronged definition. If you're not familiar with it, I'll go through each of the prongs. Um, it deserves the description. Uh, the first one focuses on someone who has a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. The second piece is has a record of such impairment. And the third is being regarded as having such an impairment. And they're kind of nuanced, so let's walk through them. A physical or mental impairment means that when an individual has a disability that perhaps makes you approach life and activities in a different way. This could include having a major bodily function like your endocrine system or breathing or learning that's done differently. This includes things also like bending, lifting, reading, and concentration. These are major life activities. And if we do them differently because of a physical or mental impairment, then that qualifies as having a disability. The next prong focuses on having a record of such impairment. And so this gets a little different. This might be something like when you were in high school, perhaps uh, you were in a psychiatric facility for treatment. And you know later on, somebody's interviewing you and you're no longer receiving that treatment, but there's a record of that treatment. You're still qualified as an individual with a disability under the ADA. Another example of having a record of such an impairment is somebody who's um, had cancer, was treated for cancer, so cell generation, which is a major life activity. It was different than people without cancer. Cancer went into remission, you were cured through treatment, you still have a record of having that disability, you're still covered even though you're living without cancer. And the third prong of the definition is regarded as. Here, there's a couple of different ways, like an individual might have a facial disfigurement. Well, that individual doesn't necessarily have a disability that rises to impact a major life activity, but society could view them as having a disability. So they're regarded as having such an impairment and covered by the ADA. And I also like to include this, you know, kind of like a water cooler talk, um, which is uh, unfortunate, but a reality where some employers, there might be coworkers that view individuals as having disabilities. And yet there is no evidence of that, but that employer needs to understand that that's regarding as others and puts them at risk as well. So these are the three prong definitions. If that was new to you, hopefully you were able to, to you know, add in to your knowledge base. If it was a refresher, then here on the 33rd anniversary of the ADA, it's good to recommit to understanding these uh, civil rights protections all begin with that definition. All right, so now we've covered, you know, we met Matt, we covered the ticket program, and we covered the ADA in connection to reasonable accommodation in the definition. Um, and um, I know Pat's going to be quite surprised, but we're right on schedule, Pat, and I want to kick it back to you to see if we have any questions coming in. <laughs> yes, I am surprised and pleased. Nice going, Derek. Uh, we could get the first question is when we get on many webinars. So let me just hand you the softball. It says, how can I find out whether I receive SSI or SSDI? Thanks, Pat. This is Derek. Yeah, we do get it a lot, and it's an important one because if you're receiving it, then you can qualify for the ticket program. We really recommend discussing it with one of our Social Security representatives. And like, if you wanna ask in the chat here, this is a personal question and we can't answer those today. So we recommend 
if you have questions about your benefits and or the type of benefits you're receiving, you call the Beneficiary Support Helpline. Um, and we'll say this a couple of times, but I'll just mention it here. Um, that's a toll-free number. It's 1-800-772-1213 um, or 1-800-328-0778. Um, th this is a, a social security um, helpline that can help you from 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. Monday through Friday. We'll bring up a, a, that, this uh, resource later on as well. You can log in to my SSA accounts. We're not covering that today, but if you access our WISE On Demand recordings, we frequently cover how to create a, a My Social Security account. And if you have one of those, you can also look in there to, to see if you have uh, are receiving SSI or SSDI as well. Thanks, Derek. This is Pat again. One of our questioners noticed that you said that Matt worked with both his his state PR agency and an employment network. And they wanna know how that really works. Thanks, Pat. This is Derek again. This is a really good question and an important one because when you have access to multiple service providers, you can get the value from them, but you have to can work with them consecutively, not at the same time. So you can work with both your state VR agency and with your employment network, um, as Matt did. Um, normally what happens is that the, you work with the state VR agency first, you, you receive some vocational rehabilitation or training. Maybe you wanna go back to school to get a, um, a degree from your community college that would better position you to be competitive for your career track. That happens. And then your ticket could be transferred from the state VR agency they close your service over there and they could um, transfer it over to an employment network who would then provide um, perhaps those ongoing support services, a job coach helping you with some, you know, reporting uh, your earnings um, and, you know, helping you navigate kind of successful retention of employment. So it is very possible. We look at those as a, a continuum or consecutive services and we call that partnership plus. So many states, you might run into that. Um, in other states, they might not have a formal partnership plus agreement, but you can still do both. Work with your state VR agency first, then ask them to transfer your ticket when your services close. You'll get the best out of both members of your employment team. Thanks, Derek. Here's a question from someone who says, what happens after I hopefully get a job? I want, I might have questions about reasonable accommodations that might work for me, or I might need ideas of what might help. Is there somebody I can talk to or who can help me then? Thanks, Pat. This is Derek again. Um, that's an excellent question. Um, you know, we all evolve and we all kind of have a lot of different questions to answer along the pathway to work. And so what, where you're at today, you might not have those questions, but tomorrow you might. The first thing that I'd recommend if, if you are receiving benefits and you're interested in the TICA program is you know, to, to build your employment team. The employment networks can help provide you that support when you want it along that path, um, pathway to work and throughout the employment process. So the ENs could actually help answer your questions. You might not want a reasonable accommodation during the application process. And you might start work and find out, wow, to do that essential function, one of my main job tasks, the more I do it, the more I realize that I need an accommodation. You know, I, I can't sit as long as I thought I could to do this task. So then you could go to your EN to talk to them about how to communicate with your employer about making that ask at that point. Um, so requesting accommodations, how to do it, communicating with your employer about th that, um, communicating with Social Security and helping report your earnings, as I mentioned, ENs can do all of that. Now, there's also other resources that are out there. And so you, know, you could do your own research. And I know most of you like to do research because you know, we all pick up an internet browser and start exploring things. 
if you're going to do that without you know your vr partner or your en partner i would really recommend the job accommodation network you can explore uh, what they call jan and that's at askjan.org and you can explore um, over 35 years worth of collected resources around individuals with disabilities, reasonable accommodations in all types of settings, sectors, and work tasks. So askjan.org um, would be another resource that I'd recommend. And you know, and and don't worry about that. We all evolve, and you know, some folks don't have disabilities, and you acquire disability in the work. And then you have to stop work. And when you go back, you got to ask people. So um, put your employment team together and use the job accommodation network. If you like, you can also chat online with the human factors specialist at Jan. You could email them and they have a toll free number. It's all confidential. So you can ask all the questions you need to figure out how to best position yourself for the reasonable accommodation process. Thanks, Derek. Um, next question actually uh, sounds like if someone wants to know about reasonable accommodations, uh, but they have an invisible disability. They say, my disability isn't that obvious. I'm not able to stand for long periods of time, but you wouldn't know it if you looked at me. What if my employer doesn't believe me when I request an accommodation? Yes, thanks, Pat. This is Derek again. Um, unfortunately, this is a, it's not a question that is an infrequent one. It's a frequent one. So whether you call them invisible or non-apparent disabilities, um, you know, this, this individual is about, you know, it's hard to stand. Um, but the point about non-apparent disabilities, as I prefer to call them, is that, um, you know, about, um, you know, somewhere around 20 to 25, 26% of our adult population in the United States has a disability. 75% of us have non-apparent or invisible disabilities. So this question represents the majority of people with disabilities because we can't see them. Um, when it comes to that, uh, you have the same rights as protected by the three prongs definition of the ADA, you know, standing, is a major life activity so is bending and lifting in these things and if you're not able to do that then you're able to um, with protection request reasonable accommodation if somebody doesn't believe you um, what i would recommend is going back to the beginning of the request process and making sure that we're asking the right person some companies have employee manuals look in the employee manual of for tips about who to engage for the reasonable accommodation process. Um, if there isn't really great training, that supervisor or manager might not be really well informed, but the human resources point of contact might be the one that would say, oh, I, I understand and confirm, are you requesting a reasonable accommodation? And that would open up a dialogue with a trained member of the company that would not be able to ignore it like the manager was trying to ignore it. Um, normally, it's a lack of training. Sometimes it is discrimination. Company would then have to deal with that internally with that manager. Um, there are so many options. I would also recommend looking at ashjan.org. You know, go in there and say, well, here is the type of uh, limitation that I have. And then you'll explore um, the different uh, options for alternatives. So. You know, is there a way to do that work sitting? Uh, could could you potentially have a sit to stand uh, desk that would allow for the same task to be done, but have multiple um, you know, uh, standing and sitting options? So a couple things there. First is find the right po point of entry. Go to the person that you think has the right training. Again, your employment network could also assist with that strategy and could also partner with you in talking to the employer. So if you're part of the ticket program, consider talking about that with your EN as well. Wow, that's, that's quite, a, quite a mouthful of options there, Derek, thanks. Uh, we probably need to move on to the next part of your presentation. I just wanna remind folks that we'll have another Q&A session in a bit. 
So if you would please keep those good questions coming, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Back to you, Derek. This is Derek. Thank you, Pat. And thanks for the questions. Appreciate the different perspectives and I'm trying to dive in more deeply to what folks are looking for today. Um, speaking of diving in more deeply, that's what we're going to do now for the next section and looking at reasonable accommodation and what is reasonable accommodation in more detail. So on, on our first slide here for this section, um, it brings this definition up. Reasonable accommodations are changes to a job, work environment, work schedule, or any other adjustment that makes it possible for an employee with a disability to perform a job for which they are qualified. I think it's really important, those three things, let's recall them. Job, the job task, the essential functions that we were talking about, things that you would see like in a job description or the work environment. Um, this is of course where we're performing the duties of that job and there might be a barrier to access the area where those essential functions or tasks would take uh, be done. Or the third area, the work schedule. And of course, in this area, we think about needing an adjustment in the schedule or the hours that the work would be performed. So while I've been mentioning different types of reasonable accommodations throughout, let's now explore a few more examples and then we'll see what Matt ended up requesting as well. So on this slide, we have a list of different types of reasonable accommodations, and it's not a comprehensive list. And that's because there's literally thousands of different types of reasonable accommodations that can be made, but we can group them. And so we'll explore the groups and I'll provide a couple other examples for those groups. For the first group, we have the modified flexible work schedule for appointments or breaks. Now remember, we brought up those three areas. The third one was the schedule, you know, when work gets done. Um, so an example here is, you know, perhaps there's a, an employee who lives with an anxiety disorder and that individual needs to take some medicine and in the morning and might need to have a later start time. So that's a modified work schedule. And that's an, you know, a reasonable accommodation for a person with a non-apparent disability. Um, and that is a, it's a frequently asked question uh, for reasonable accommodation. It doesn't have to be every day of the week. Maybe it changes. Um, another person might need flex time for some medical appointments. You know, so perhaps I mentioned you know, receiving treatments for cancer earlier. If you're working with cancer and you need to receive treatment, then you would have a modified work schedule and perhaps you know, put in a request for, I need to have this day off, is it possible that I work longer hours these other four days of the week to make up for that lost time? The next category is working from home. This could be applicable to certain job types. Um, certainly it's been more applicable in the last couple of years than perhaps ever before. For some people, you know, work from home quite simply allows them to work. There could be people who have significant mobility disabilities. There could be people that are, you know, medically fragile is a term that's sometimes used, or individuals who have challenges um, accessing personal care attendant services that allow them to um, exit their home. So for those individuals looking for work from home as uh, an employment opportunity could come through the form of reasonable accommodation um, if a job is designated as potentially hybrid, well, the request could be, I can do that job, but it maybe it can't be hybrid. Can I do it from home the entire time? Next, we have a list of equipment. Some of you may be familiar with different assistive technologies. I spent a great amount of time working in assistive technology centers. Here we have a, a, a short list of some sample equipment that can be formed, um, used to perform essential tasks. Um, alternative keyboards or a mouse, uh, a different type of mice that are out there. Um, if you have a cumulative trauma disorder, like a repetitive stress injury from typing or from overuse of a mouse, you could get kind of a claw hand going. Um, there's all sorts of different types of keyboards and mice that are available. 
those are reasonable accommodations to change up from the standard designs. Headphones we have here, if you work in a cubicle environment and have a hard time concentrating, remember concentration is a major life activity. If the noise from the cubicle environment um, is um, impacting your productivity, you could request headphones that would be noise canceling headphones. Um, or if you have kind of a neck injury, you could use those headphones to also um, uh, be a, like a headset uh, multi-purpose that would allow you not to have to hold a telephone up to your head for a long period of time. Screen readers are next. Screen readers assist um, individuals uh, who um, are blind to access information by having it read to them by a speech synthesizer. You might experience speech synthesizers on different devices as well. Well, we have a lot of blind folks to thank for that because that's where the technology generated back in the 70s. Um, screen readers can also help individuals with learning disabilities, um, especially some software packages that have embedded screen readers with the text on the screen where uh, people who are dyslexic can split text to have more space between lines and also hear the text read to them. And last, voice recognition. Um, this is becoming more commonplace, but um, speech dictation for individuals who are unable to type um, allows them to interact with computers for things like emails or doc document creation, but also command and control of the actual computing environment. So there's a lot of assistive technology out there. This is just a beginning example um, for you uh, to consider. Next two areas are more about services. Uh, for individuals who are deaf, we have sign language interpreters, uh, that's a service, or closed captioning, like we have today being provided during this webinar. Um, both of those need to be set up in advance through a service schedule, but allow individuals who are deaf to access communication and content in a preferred manner. For folks that know American Sign Language, that could be their language of first choice, and so it allows them to communicate uh, more effectively using the interpreter. And last, we have job coaches, readers, or other assistants. Uh, a, a job coach I mentioned earlier could help in employment transition and retention, really in understanding sometimes the nuances at work um, or com com communicating with supervisors or colleagues. Um, readers, you know, for a blind person, you could have a reader uh, in order to access uh, material that's not available in other formats. Um, so those are some examples of reasonable accommodations. Hopefully you're familiar with these or you've learned a couple more. Um, again, there's literally thousands of these. And recall that reasonable accommodations applies to all jobs, the task, the environment, and kind of when it happens too in the schedule. You know, so if you're interested in exploring the, the world's best database of reasonable accommodations, check it out online at ashjan.org, Job Accommodation Network. I check it out about once a week. There's always good content there, and they're growing their um, lists of examples and recommendations. I highly recommend them. Okay, so with those examples in mind, let's check back to Matt. Um, Matt did secure employment. I know that's not a surprise, because that's what our success stories are always about. Um, and on the job, Matt's primary means of communication ended up being, you know, a keyboard. It, you know, it was a slightly different keyboard, but that allowed him to communicate via email. And really because he could read lips, one-on-one -on -one meetings, you know, could be very productive. But in larger group settings, Matt needed a sign language interpreter to help him participate fully. And also note that that also allows everyone to participate fully. So a sign language interpreter wouldn't be needed if everyone knew American Sign Language. So this isn't a burden that Matt was placing. It was uh, creating an environment for everyone to communicate together. Um, so with this in mind, let's now transition to Matt's decision on how he was going to request these reasonable accommodations and this gets into the topic of disability disclosure. So let's talk about it a little bit. So disability disclosure, um, 
can go in a lot of different directions and we'll hope to increase your confidence around you know what is it um, and uh, your choice to choose to disclose let's think about matt first as a job seeker who's deaf and needs accommodations, Matt wasn't sure about, you know, applying for a job, like, would it work? Or would that employer discriminate and say, mm, no, we're gonna go in a different direction. We've never had a deaf employee before. So at first, because of that mindset, he was reluctant to ask for anything um, at the beginning of the process. He was wondering, you know, would they know about those accommodations? and whether it would you know, take him out of the running for that job. So while Matt has a disability and it becomes obvious or apparent when talking with him, it really isn't known at first and certainly not in the application process. You know, if it's an online submission, nobody would know that he was deaf unless he disclosed it in that application. So that was the first choice if he would disclose that he would need a sign language interpreter during the interview. And then later on when he was employed in those larger group meetings um, and that there would be an opportunity to you know, follow up and request those accommodations later on. So let's cover this a little bit more. When we think of Matt's situation and we think about disability disclosure, specifically, what is it? For Matt, he knew he wanted to disclose for those specific reasons. Um, and we'll cover them shortly. But in general, when you decide that you want to tell your employer that you have a disability that's impacting your ability to do your job, that is disclosing a disability. And people disclose disabilities all the time for a lot of different reasons. But normally it comes down to, I wanna be productive. And so if we think of reasonable accommodations about really in terms of being the most productive um, contributor for that employer, then we start to think about this not as a problem, but as being an effective solution. We do think about it for different reasons in terms of the nature of the disability. You know, we have to think what's the disability? Is it auditory, sensory, or mobility as examples? And then the limitations that are involved, the disability, doesn't allow me to do something, like I, I'm unable to hear, see, or lift. And then how that affects my ability to perform an essential job function or task. What's the gap? Because then we could suggest the reasonable accommodation would close the gap and allow for productivity again. When we think about this, then we say, well, do I have to disclose? And the short answer is no. Disclosure is definitely your choice. And you know, you're not required to disclose when you apply. You're not required to disclose during employment. And if you don't need a specific accommodation, you can choose not to disclose your disability forever. And that's you know, not only your right, but many people do that. That said, if you do require accommodations or other types of employment supports that will facilitate your success in the application process, or on the job, then you're likely going to need to disclose because you're gonna ask for a reasonable accommodation. Um, and if employers receive that, they have the right to require documentation of your disability in order to provide that reasonable accommodation. So it is your choice, but you may need to come up with a disability disclosure plan that says, you know, if I require reasonable accommodation, this is what I'm gonna do. So you're not caught off guard and you can do this with your employment team. Remember those ENs or remember going to the job accommodation network or the state VR agencies, they're all great partners to go through the planning process with. Um, I recommend a few steps in advanced preparation and it, it sometimes it can come down to a single sentence can I frame how I would disclose if I want to ask for a reasonable accommodation in a sentence? I have this disability that impacts my ability to do this task, and I request a reasonable accommodation of, you know, fill in the blank in order to allow me to perform that essential job function. 
that's really easy for me to say, I've been doing this for 28 years, but if you can work with an employment team, you would think about in advance how to ask for it. You would be a reminder of, of your legal protection against discrimination and right to reasonable accommodation, and that it would help you reduce your stress and build your self-advocacy skills before asking. I'll also mention here that, you know, for an apparent disability, it might be different than a non-apparent disability. Meaning if you have an apparent disability as a wheelchair or scooter user, or somebody who's blind that perhaps uses a white cane for navigation, well, these are apparent disabilities and you don't really have the ability to choose to disclose them. The employer does have the right, if you have an apparent disability, to ask how you would perform an essential job func function with or without reasonable accommodation. So if you have an apparent disability, you may take a slightly different tactic. Many colleagues that I know would have disability pride and come out and say, you know, I got my college degree. I've had this disability for a long time. I know exactly what I need and I can do this job. This is what I need. Do you have any questions? And if that employer is not discriminating and looking for diverse talent pool, they're gonna say that's a person with confidence who has the required skill sets. Average cost of accommodation for half of those that cost something is $300, let's go. So think about that if it's apparent, apparent or non-apparent um, and use your employment team to prepare. All right, so we're gonna dig in a little bit deeper on three reasons you might choose to disclose. I've mentioned these throughout, but I just wanna reinforce them here. They're listed here. One, to ask for the job accommodation. Two, to receive the benefits or privileges of employment and three, to explain an unusual circumstance. So just to go back through those, you know, the first one to ask for a change in the way you do work and that gets the reasonable accommodation. The, and we've talked about so many of those, but to receive the benefits or privileges of employment, let's say there's a training program at work and you're working there and you'd like to go to improve your skills and you need a sign language interpreter or you need captioning, um, you know, that would be something that you would need to disclose in order to request the reasonable accommodation. It's not doing your job, it's accessing that in-service training that's available to all employees. Um, that's a, a benefit of employment as opposed to kind of, you know, your, your medical type healthcare benefits um, or privilege. That's something that you should consider. You might also disclose to explain an unusual circumstance. Something might be, you know, maybe there's construction at work and that is causing something in the air to impact your medical condition to worsen. And you could say, well, why this construction is going on? I either need to be moved to another office or I'd like to work from home. And the employer could say, well, could you give me a, a documentation from a medical professional that supports that request? But that's an unusual circumstance. If the construction wasn't happening, you wouldn't be asking that. So re remember those three reasons because normally we fall inside of one of those when asking for reasonable accommodation and choosing to disclose. All right, we've covered a lot and here we are at making the ask. Um, when we think about making the ask, um, we have these five different tips um, about how to do that during the job search. The first one is consider your timing. Knowing when to disclose your disability and ask for a reasonable accommodation, it, you know, frankly, it can be a little tricky and it's highly personal. Some people want to let the recruiter know early on in initial screening, while others prefer to kind of wait later into the process or, you know, at point of offer or after point of offer. That choice is yours. You need to consider your timing and come up with your plan. The second one, ask questions about the hiring process. You know, don't be afraid to get the information you need uh, so you can know what to expect and make your informed decision about you know, disclosure and, and asking for reasonable accommodation as you go through the process. 
you can do that if it's at a company that has like a talent acquisition or recruiting team. Uh, that's a bigger business. You can ask them, tell me the whole process. I want to know I'm here. What are the next stages? Am I going to have an interview that's a panel? Will I have a, several phases of interviews? After the interviews, what happens? Uh, that way you can plan in advance. The third one, be specific about your needs. Now this one is, it's key. It's up to you about what you require in order to be really at your best productive, product, productive self. Sorry about that. Um, to perform the essential job functions optimally is what we all want as workers. And so you will only know, do I really need to disclose and ask for those accommodations to perform optimally? Or can I get to a high product productivity rate without reasonable accommodation? Talk to your employment team about that. Help them, have them help you think that through. Number four, frame your request positively. You know, I mentioned this before when an individual was requesting it with pride to turn this around to say, yes, I am going to disclose, but I have the skills and the training and I'm qualified. My reasonable accommodation is, you know, these things. And the reason I need them in the back of your mind is because society wasn't designed without barriers. You know, they didn't design this job or this workplace for everybody. And reasonable accommodation is bridging that gap. And I know if I can have that tool, I can be productive and be part of the mission that that employer is delivering. And the last one, know before the hiring process begins how much you are comfortable sharing. Now, this is that advanced preparation. You don't need to disclose in detail and share only what's relevant to the success of the position. An employer doesn't have a right to know your diagnosis. An employer only needs to know the specific disability related condition as it ties to an essential job function, period. So create the, the contained information that you're comfortable sharing and have that framed in advance that will allow you to discuss it um, with uh, confidence and without divulging information you don't want to share. All right, so we have the reasons and now we have three key tips for requesting reasonable accommodations. The first one is keeping it simple. I mentioned you don't have to talk about the diagnosis, um, but you, know, you don't also need to get fancy. You don't have to know the specific language I've used. What you have to do is to say, in order to perform that function, I need something else, and I'd like to have a discussion about that. Well, the employer like, didn't hear disability, maybe didn't hear medical condition, but heard, I'm having trouble doing my job, and I'd like to talk about it. That's very plain language. And that, under the ADA, means you just requested a reasonable accommodation and the interactive process would begin. It's incumbent upon the employer to handle those next steps. Second, while you don't need to put a reasonable accommodation request in writing, it's not required under the ADA, all you have to do is verbally ask. It can help you document your request. And if you are in a position where you're unsure the employer is going to respond to it, we do recommend putting it in writing that way it can be more formally reacted to. And last, the third tip, talk to the appropriate people. You mentioned this before. Um, if you ask a supervisor and you're not getting a good response, this might be somebody else in the organization, the human resources representative, larger employers, um, very largest employers now have accommodation teams, which you would engage with for your request. Um, it could be like an ADA type coordinator. And I know some employers that actually now have assistive technology directories where you don't request reasonable accommodation. You just go in the directory and like you're ordering a new computer, you order assistive technology. Each organization will be different. Research who's the right person to be talking to around making that reasonable accommodation request. Important tip there. All right, so now let's look at what did Matt do? Let's find out 
Thanks to the ADA, Matt could consider and request adjustments to a job in the application process. I'll say that again. Thanks to the ADA, that was possible for Matt. Without this legislation 33 years ago, this would not be happening for Matt, nor for others around the country. So Matt and his counselor identified those accommodations that we talked about were essential and that you know, could demonstrate that he could offer the employer during an application process. And they agreed to an approach that Matt was going to disclose his disability and request reasonable accommodations. And all of that made him more comfortable in approaching you know, that, that job. Well, Matt landed first a part-time job. You know, and that part-time position was as an administrative assistant, and he was performing those functions at a nonprofit. That nonprofit supported people with developmental disabilities, and he had a variety of administrative assistant tasks. And um, of equal importance was also his self-confidence grew, and he he felt good making a contribution, but he also knew that he had more to offer. So he reconnected, um, you know, he had this interest in full-time work. And so he reconnected with his employment network, remember CIS, and those connections had grown really strong and CIS heard he wanted full-time work and the staff there really appreciated his skills and what he brought to the team. Um, and of course, Matt knew that they could provide reasonable accommodation. They're doing the business of placing people with disabilities into work environments. So when he expressed that desire, it happened that they had a, an opening on their human resources team and the CIS offered him full-time work as a human resources assistant. And Matt was delighted. His path to you know, independence and financial self-sufficiency was being realized, starting with part-time work in a nonprofit, moving to this employment network and you know, he commented, I am in a supportive environment and a position that works well for me. It feels good to be productive. And now I could afford things I could not have before. So, you know, because of the ADA, there's civil rights protections. Because of the ADA, Matt could ask for reasonable accommodations. And because of the ticket program, Matt was able to transition through part-time to full-time work and to feel good about where he is and what he's doing. So positive experience for Matt and on, he's thriving now. He traded the SSDI benefit for his paycheck and expresses the satisfaction. And uh, his work gives him the fulfillment and stability um, to continue building this future. And, you know, we hope Matt's career doesn't stop there. We know that he received one promotion uh, since and is doing more work on that human resources team for the employment network. So congratulations to Matt and to CIS for seeing the talent that's there. You know, accommodations did enable Matt to be productive and they enabled that productivity to be with the nonprofit and now with CIS. So there's good on, on both sides there for sure. Um, the ticket program made it possible and we're proud of that, but Matt, made it happen with the right accommodations. And we encourage you to find out the right accommodations that may help you. And to do that, we would like to now focus on what's the next step for you, putting this information together, if you're motivated and interested to, to move forward. So with that in mind, we cover this notion of choosing work. Like why choose work? We've covered the civil rights legislation, and we've talked about reasonable accommodation. And if you're sitting there contemplating, is this right for me? We like to say that work works. It's a pretty simple saying, but work does work for people. It gets individuals out of poverty. It gives people the ability to make their own choice. It also, when you have more choice, if you're working and earning, then you may have when you're receiving benefits. So that's going to give you some excess money. And in that sense, work can be great, but it also allows you to attach to a mission. You know, we're working potentially with a team, we're collecting a paycheck, and we have a sense of achievement. We could also work in self-employment, deliver a service and find that sense of achievement. So 
We know that earning a living through employment is not something that everybody can do. That's why the social security benefits exist, um, but it, it is available for you to consider like Matt did. And once you understand the services and supports from the program will bring for you and the support they bring for you, then people often decide that the rewards outweigh the risks. And again, today's section you know, has focused on reasonable accommodations and you know, disability disclosure and the theme about only you can make that choice. Well, the same is here, choosing work, only you can make that choice and it's completely up to you to see if that's the right choice for you. We do talk about Matt with the ticket program and an employment team um, and surrounding yourself with those team members is critical. It helped Matt find his pathway. And in fact, he became an employee at the very employment network that served him. Um, there are the employment networks and the state vocational rehabilitation agencies. Let's also mention members of the employment team that could help through the ticket program, the work incentives and assistance projects or the WIPAs. That's where you access the benefit counselors and they can help you think about the impact work has on your benefits. And um, the other entity, we call them the PABs, the Protection and Advocacy for Beneficiaries of Social Security. Um, uh, those PABs are really like your legal advisor if you have any discrimination. So all of this is under the ticket program. Again, for individuals ages 18 to 64 receiving disability benefits from Social Security and want to work. So all of those employment team members, of course, can help with providing advice around requesting accommodations, job coaching, resume guidance, interview preparation, and, and many more services and supports. It's a good option and something for you to consider for sure. If you're unsure of where to start, we highly recommend reaching out to the Ticket to Work helpline. The Ticket to Work programs um, beneficiary Support Helpline has staff, they're called Beneficiary Support Specialists, that are there to answer your questions about what benefits you're receiving, but also to help you connect into, you know, where to start. They can give you a list of employment networks, they can point you to other resources to help answer your questions, and you could reach them Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern Time at one 866 968 7842 or via TTY at 1 866 833 2967. So definitely keep them in mind and I, I urge you to reach out if you're considering choosing work. That's a great place to begin. And with that, it is now time to ask Pat to come back for our second round of questions. Pat? And we do have some out there. Let me start, just start. The first one says, a lot of descriptions for jobs have requirements like the ability to lift, you know, 20 pounds or needing to travel a certain amount of time. So I just don't apply for those jobs. Is there some way I can find out if any of these requirements are actually essential to the job or if they may be able to accommodate me if I'm not able to do them? Thanks, Pat. This is Derek. I, you know, this is challenging and I work with employers that, you know, list this. And part of the reason they're there is um, sometimes job descriptions become outdated. Um, so I'm going to provide several answers because I don't think there's a single answer here. One is if you really want a job and it lists in there um, an essential function, but you can do all the others. I would encourage you to apply and or speak to the recruiter or the employer about the significance of that bullet in the job description. Perhaps it hasn't been refreshed in years or more importantly, perhaps the employer is open to a reasonable accommodation. There is a, an approach if lifting 20 pounds on a regular basis is required, but it's only required for a small amount of time what percent of time is it done? And is there a way to switch if it is 
an ability to switch with another employee, then that could happen. Or if it's around work schedule switch, I'm familiar with employers that schedule people to work hours that aren't unable to lift. Those hours happen when the lifting tasks are not available to be done. Let's say you're receiving a shipment and it only comes in on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Your hours could be working around those shipment arrivals. That's one approach I've seen employers take. Another one I've seen is if the lifting isn't an essential job function, it's a non-essential function that you could switch that. It's a form of reasonable accommodation for a non-essential job function. And so you would take on a task that another employee who can lift would um, give to you and they would take the lifting. So there's a couple tactics there. The, th the third piece of this is if we don't go after the work that we want, then we'll never know if we can get it. Using your employment team with your career plan, your individual work plan in place, we, you should have pride in who you are and going after the work you want. So if we don't apply and we don't ask, we'll never get to where we wanna be. So while we don't know if the answer will be yes, uh, it doesn't hurt to ask and it doesn't hurt to push those employers to consider um, you know, a quarter of our population has disabilities and a lot of people are unable to lift 20 pounds. Let's rethink how lifting happens. And collectively, we'll see that technology is trying to impact that in a reasonable accommodation before long could be available for everybody. Thanks, Derek. Uh, next question is, I recently applied to work for the food service company that's also a federal contractor and they gave me paperwork asking if I have a disability. I didn't think employers were allowed to do that. Can they do that? <laughs> yeah, thanks, Pat. This is a great question. Yeah, and, you know, federal contractors represent such a large portion of the employment in the country. Um, yes, they can do that. Um, it, it falls under requirement from Section 503 of the Rehabilitation Act that actually requires federal contractors, and in some cases, subcontractors, um, all these businesses that are doing um, work for the federal government, they're required to take affirmative action to recruit, hire, employ, promote, and retain qualified people with disabilities. So they don't have a choice. If they're not doing it, they're gonna get in trouble with the federal government. They would um, do this, it's called self-identification, which is different than disability disclosure, but they would ask a job candidate, just like you're filling out an application form, at that same time, they would ask you to fill out a self-identification form. What's on the form? <laughs> this is Derek. Yeah, so the self-identification, um, as opposed to disclosure, Self-identification is more about a checking of the box. Really like that way of thinking about this. You voluntarily can identify as an individual with a disability by checking a box. So a federal contractor gives you a form. They're mandated to use all of the required content on the form. And then they'll ask you, basically there's three boxes. You can identify as a person with disability identify as not being a person with a disability or choose not to respond. You don't have to identify what the disability is. You know, so that's what the form is about. Um, it's trying to allow the federal government to know, is there affirmative action? Meaning, is the federal government um, watching the way they spend their money? And are the businesses that are receiving payments from the federal government partnering with talent sourcing agencies to interview applicants with disabilities. So in this case, if a department is working with a business and that business could partner with, oh, let's say employment networks to get applicants who are beneficiaries that are ticket holders, well, mm -hmm. they would see self-identification rates on those forms go up. Does that help? It does, thank you. Well, it helped me. 
Um, another questioner <laughs> says, I have a mental health condition. What are some accommodations that can help me on the job? Yeah, so um, this is a great question. In um, this is Derek, mental health conditions normally are non-apparent. So it goes back to that discussion we had earlier around, um, you know, if we're going to disclose how we would do that and then thinking through that advanced preparation, the types of accommodations, flexible work schedule, um, a, a space perhaps where we have um, um, the ability to focus on our work. Um, these are a couple of examples like that noise canceling headphone um, and you know taking breaks. Um, normally, the recommendations as you see through sjan.org, the Jan Job Accommodation Network, will look at like executive functioning and kind of break out different types of behaviors at work and then look at how different forms of mental health conditions could um, receive you know, those flexible schedules. Uh, things like depression, anxiety disorder uh, are common in the workforce and impact you know, 90% of us as workers. We either know somebody with a mental health condition in our family or in our neighborhood or in the workplace. Um, so these forms of reasonable accommodation are actually quite common. Specifically, there's so many examples out there. You asked, what are some other examples? I'd really recommend visiting two organizations, Mental Health America. You could Google them. If you're not as connected with them and you're living with a mental health condition, it would be a fantastic resource. If you're a service provider or an employer and you're not getting information from Mental Health America, um, I'd recommend that too. And of course, the Job Accommodation Network. On both sites, search for reasonable accommodations and they'll give great advice coming from the community itself. And I think that's the key. What works from people with mental health conditions, reasonable accommodation experiences will be listed there. Thanks, Derek. Yeah. Clearly the askjan.org is one of the, the premier organizations that people can turn to for advice. And you know, personal consultation actually sounds like Unfortunately, yeah, this is there. Absolutely. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, they're um, part of the Department of Labor's Technical Assistance Center um, to support both business and individuals with disabilities to kind of bring everyone together. And they're a fantastic resource. So, um, yeah, just wrap up and say thanks, Pat, for everything and happy ADA to everyone for joining us. <laughs> happy ADA to you too, dear. I know that what we've gone through is going to be useful to people, whether they're thinking about working, looking for work, or if they're already working. Now, Derek told you about the Ticket to Work helpline, but because this is such an important resource, I'm going to repeat that information. The helpline has trained and certified support specialists who can give you information about your personal situation. We can't do that on a national webinar. So please take the time and give them a call at 1-866-968-7842. Or you can do, reach them via TTY at 1-866-833-2967. The lines are open Monday through Friday, 8 to 8 at Eastern Time. You might also want to look at our website at choosework.ssa.gov. You'll find many more details on the website about reasonable accommodations too. In fact, I did a quick search this morning and found more than 50 articles, blogs, and documents that specifically reference reasonable accommodations. If you'd like to learn more about our monthly webinars, think about subscribing to our email updates. That way you'll find out about each month's topic and be among the first to register. The link will take you to a page where you can sign up. You might also want to subscribe to our Choose Work blog. We blog weekly and share information about the ticket program, work incentives, service providers, and other topics. And there's still another way to get information about the ticket program. You can opt in to receive our text messages. Just text TICKET, T-I-C-K-E-T, -E to 474747. 
Standard messaging rates may apply. And you can opt out at any time. It's important to note that if you need to contact Social Security's Office of Employment Support, that's the offices that manages the Ticket to Work program, please do it electronically rather than by postal mail. You can email them at support at choosework.ssa.gov. And just a reminder, please don't include any personally identifiable information like your social security number. And of course, you can always call the helpline. We'd like to have you join us for our next webinar, which is five frequently asked questions about working while you receive disability benefits. It'll be on August 23rd from 3 p.m. to 4.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Registration is now open at choosework.ssa.gov forward slash wise, or you can call the Ticket to Work helpline to register. I'm guessing that many of you are using or would like to use the internet to look for jobs. We want to make sure you're aware of a program that can help you access the internet if you need financial help to do that. The program is called the Affordable Connectivity Program and it's sponsored by the Federal Communications Commission, or FCC. That program helps ensure that households can afford the broadband that they need for work, for school, for healthcare, for any number of things. It provides eligible households with a discount on broadband service and connected devices. It provides a discount of up to $30 per month toward the internet for eligible households and up to $75 a month for homes on qualifying tribal land. To find out if you're eligible for the program and discover how to apply, go to fcc.gov forward slash ACP. Also, it's important to note that individuals who receive SSI are pre-qualified for eligibility. Finally, these webinars are for you. If you have ideas for future webinar topics, let us know. You can provide your feedback by taking our survey. A link will pop up after the webinar or you can find the survey in the web links pod or by visiting the ticket program website at choosework.ssa.gov forward slash surveys forward slash wise. I wanna thank you for taking the time to be with us today. And I hope we've given you some information you'll be able to use in your own situation. This concludes today's webinar. <laughs>